the back about the three. It wouldn't happen here. I'm not saying it, it would have happened here. I'm just saying maybe sometime you happen to be paging around in the back of your Bible and you saw these three famous missionary journeys. Anyhow, that's the part that we were studying and you were there and we were sending people out. Um, it's also the part of the book where the church in Antioch sends financial resources to the church in Jerusalem. It's the first time that that ever happened where one church did that for another church. Um, it's where everybody is kind of starting to get a sense of the fact that uh, God's story includes the whole world and not just their little corner of it. It's a really exciting part in the history of the, of the church. And having you there with us in March and sending out this young couple and getting to settle into our own church building and start thinking about how can we serve our town, it felt a, a lot like the book of Acts was really coming to life in our congregation. I don't know if you felt it, but we felt it, and uh, it was very exciting. So then, after you left, we continued studying the book of Acts, and we got to the last section, Acts 21 to 28. And again, in case you haven't read the book of Acts lately, the last section is pretty different from the rest, because this is where Paul ends up in jail for good. First he's in Jerusalem, then he's in Judea, and then he's in prison in Rome. He's actually in prison for about seven and a half of the last eight chapters of the book. One third of the whole book. Paul, the great apostle Paul, is in prison. That's as many chapters as all three missionary journeys combined. He's in prison. And I have to say, it's kind of a sobering thing to be going along feeling excited because the Bible is coming to life in your church and, and then you get to the part where things basically come to a screeching halt and the guy who's in charge gets thrown in jail. But that's how the book of Acts ends. And that's what I'd like to talk about for just a little bit this morning. Not all eight chapters in detail, um, but a quick overview of what happened to Paul and what it had to say to our congregation and, and what I hope it might have to say to us today. At first glance, I think it be, can be hard to see how this kind of a story relates to us. Uh, being on trial for your faith, getting thrown in prison, getting shipwrecked as you're being hauled from one prison to another, it sounds really more like something out of a movie than something out of our daily lives. But I think actually for a lot of us, there's as much in this part of the book that can speak to us in this last part of Paul's life as there is in all those fancy missionary journeys that he goes on. Uh, and I say that partly because of how, how that section starts. In chapter 21, the missionary journeys are done. Paul and his team are on their way back to Jerusalem. And at one of the stops along the way, a weird thing happens. And this is what, how Luke describes it in, in chapter 21, verse 10. I'm just gonna read two verses. He says, while we were staying for many days, a prophet, named Agabus, came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and says, said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. I think it's easy to read a passage like that and say, Man, people were weird back then taking someone's belt and tying yourself up with it to make a point, that is some biblical grade weirdness. And it's true that sometimes there's stuff in the Bible, big differences between our culture and theirs, and we, it really helps to try and understand what was going on. But this isn't really a cultural difference. It's not like people in New Testament times were going around all the time tying themselves up to make a point. This whole situation would have been as strange for Paul as it would be if I called one of you up here and asked for your belt so that I could tie myself up to make a point. I actually considered doing that, uh, but I'm not going to. Even though, coincidentally, I, one of my friends is here this morning and he sells belts, but I, um, it's very tempting. But I'm not going to because as a guest preacher, uh, I want to leave that kind of weirdness to the regulars. So, uh, But the image is important, so I found a slide. Uh, the image is important. God is telling Paul that from now on, in one way or another, his hands are going to be tied from now on. And this is not what Paul wanted to hear. 
obviously, for quite a few reasons. But one of the main ones is the fact that he had other things he wanted to do, other things he wanted to do for God. We know that he'd already written to the Christians in Rome to tell them that he hoped to come there one day. It would have been his fourth missionary journey. When you look at the back of your Bible with all the maps and stuff, there are only three. That would have been the fourth. He would have brought the powerful light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the darkness of Rome. But that was not going to happen if he ended up in prison in Jerusalem or killed. This is not what Paul would have chosen for his life. And maybe all of a sudden we start to feel like we can relate to Paul. How many of us today are at a place in our lives that we would not necessarily have chosen for ourselves? I think that's one of the main questions that this story forces us to ask. When I see that image of Paul with his hands tied, what part of my life makes me think, huh, yeah, I know that feeling. Maybe not arrested for the gospel, but not really in, as in control of my life as I would have liked to be, or as I thought I was going to be. And it can be a lot of things that does that to us, that do that to us. A tough relationship can do it. Sickness can do it. A job can do it. Or lack of a job. A son or daughter's life spinning out of control and we feel like our hands are just tied. Completely tied. But here's the thing. In a way, here's the whole point of these eight chapters. Or at least one of them. My hands being tied and God's hands being tied are not the same thing. It's easy to feel like it is. Like if I feel trapped, then somehow God must be stuck too. But it's not the same thing. In fact, sometimes it's exactly when my hands are tied that God's hands are the busiest. Listen to how Paul ends the story. Chapter 28, this is the end now. He's under house arrest in Rome. Verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And then verse 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Proclaiming the kingdom of God without hindrance. That's how this story ends. Paul's still a prisoner. His hands are still tied, figuratively, if not literally. And yet, there he is, living out the gospel without hindrance in the heart of the pagan Roman capital. And all of a sudden, we realize that all along, these last eight chapters have been Paul's final missionary journey. Not in spite of being in prison, but because he was in prison. I don't think I've ever seen a Bible that includes this in the four missionary journeys. They might be out there, but we really could. And it wasn't in spite of being in prison, it was because he was in prison that he got to Rome, finally, to announce the kingdom of God in the heart of the corrupt earthly kingdom. He hadn't been wrong when he sensed that God wanted him to go there next. This just wasn't how he'd imagined it. But it wasn't how he imagined it that mattered. It was how God imagined it. So, another question. How does God imagine your life today, this week? When he imagines your life, what does he see? I think that's the second big question that the story raises for us. If I stop imagining how I want tomorrow to be, and I ask myself how God imagines it, how does that change what I see? Especially when I realize that, just maybe, 
that place where my hands feel the most tied up, where I feel the most trapped, that's where God is at work. So maybe you've heard the expression, bloom where you're planted. To say that we should bloom where we're planted has become kind of a cliche in certain circles. I heard that it was first said by some French-speaking bishop in the 16th century. I couldn't verify that, but that's what I heard. Anyhow, you hear it now sometimes, and it can be a kind of a cliche. When Christians use it, it usually means that God calls us to bring his love and his grace and his truth into whatever situation we're in, to bloom or bear fruit or shine, if you prefer the biblical imagery, wherever we find ourselves, day in and day out. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. In a way, it's exactly what Paul is doing throughout these eight chapters. But at the same time, I think the expression can be a little bit misleading. Because for me, at least, it gives me the image of a plant being very carefully and peacefully transplanted from one flower garden into another. And, you know, blooming in that new flower garden. But life is not a flower garden. <laughs> Not a lot of the time. It wasn't for Jesus. It wasn't for Paul. It's not for you and me a lot of the time. For a lot of us, at least, sometimes, it feels like we're not really a flower that's been carefully transplanted into a flower garden. It's more like we're a tree stuck out on the face of a cliff just trying to hang on and stay alive, right? It's a lot more this kind of thing. And so, I really prefer the expression, bloom where you're trapped. <laughs> or shine where your hands are tied. Or dig your roots into the rock and hang on because God has you right where he wants you, even if it feels like you're at the end of your rope. And I realize the last one's more of a sentence than an expression. But, you get the point, right? Even out on that cliff, we can be what God has called us to be. Because maybe that's right where our calling is. Maybe that's right where our mission is tomorrow. So, before I kind of wrap up, I do want to be clear. I'm not suggesting, and I don't think the passage, I don't think the Bible is suggesting, that God calls us just to put up with whatever lousy situation comes along, because that's definitely where God's mission is for us. Sometimes we can come to that kind of conclusion. We decide that wherever things are the worst, well, that must be where God wants us. But it's not necessarily the case. It's okay to look for a way out. You know, Paul did. In Acts 9, he escaped from people who were trying to kill him in Damascus by sneaking out of the city in a basket. In Acts 16, after he'd been unjustly imprisoned, he got himself out of prison by standing up for himself and reminding his his captors that he was a Roman citizen, so how dare they? And again then in Acts 25, he makes his appeal to Caesar, which is how he ends up in Rome, but still in prison. Blooming where you're trapped doesn't mean just rolling over and being a doormat. If you're in a job that's sucking the life out of you, by all means, look for other options. If you're in an abusive relationship, please get help. If you're sick, pray for healing and go to the doctor. But don't forget either that when the doors aren't opening and your hands feel completely tied, God's are not. And his greatest imagination for your life might be, might be to use you right there where you are. I don't know where that is for you. It's one of the unfortunate things about being a guest preacher. I, I don't know all that much about your daily lives. I don't know where you feel trapped, really. I don't know where God might be wanting to use you this week. On Thursday, Shayla and the girls and I, we get back on a plane for France. So that's part of the answer for us. We're obviously, we're not trapped there like Paul was trapped in Rome. I think the girls feel trapped at school sometimes, maybe a little bit like that. But 
There are plenty of situations where we are not the ones in control. And all we can try to do is bloom where we are and ask God to do the rest. So that's Thursday for us. But in about half an hour, we're all going to walk out the door at the back of the church and under that sign there that reminds us that we are entering the mission field. And God has something for all of us out there. Loving our neighbor, talking about Jesus to somebody, being a peacemaker, caring for creation, bringing beauty into the world, or just smiling at somebody. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what it looks like when God's people bloom. It's not just pretty flowers. It's fruit. Fruit that nourishes the world. That's what it looks like when God's people bloom. And whatever little thing or big thing that God wants to do in you and through you this week, by the power of his spirit, you can do it. Even when you think your hands are tied. Because his are not. His hands are not tied. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being your children, of having a calling. We thank you for the power of your spirit that lets us grow and bloom and bear fruit even when we're trapped. We ask that you would give each person here today a sense of your calling this week, of where and how you want them to bloom and bear fruit as a witness to your kingdom and as an example of who you are. We thank you for who you are in Jesus' name.